en amana, en areo, en akaranga tangamaha, en mihiana, kiakoto katoa. Good evening and welcome to the 2016 Morris Goldsmith Lecture. I'm Sarah Leggett, I'm the Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Victoria University of Wellington this evening to enjoy this very important public lecture. The Morris Goldsmith Lecture is an endowed public lecture in honour of Morris Goldsmith, a philosopher, political theorist, and much-loved former colleague of many people here tonight. The lecture is hosted by Victoria University's philosophy program and is presented by an eminent philosopher working in ethics or political philosophy. Tonight, we are very fortunate to welcome Professor Susan Wolfe to deliver the 2016 Morris Goldsmith Lecture. Professor Wolfe is the Edna J. Corey Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina and she is an internationally recognized researcher in the fields of ethics, moral philosophy and psychology, political philosophy, action theory, and aesthetics. Professor Wolfe completed her Bachelor of Arts degree at Yale University, majoring in philosophy and mathematics. She received her PhD in philosophy from Princeton University, at the time the most prestigious philosophy department in the world. She's a widely published scholar, a fellow of the American Academy of the Arts and Sciences, and she received a Mellon Distinguished Achievement Award in the Humanities in 2002. Professor Wolfe, the third scholar to deliver the Morris Goldsmith Lecture at Victoria, will speak tonight on the topic of aesthetic responsibility. Like all of you, I'm very much looking forward to her lecture this evening. Before we welcome Professor Wolfe to the podium, let me hand over for a moment to my colleague, Associate Professor Stuart Brock, who will add a few words of welcome on behalf of the philosophy program. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Can I, um, can I just take a, a few moments my, uh, to ask you all at this moment if you haven't already turned off your cell phones? Thanks. Um, I want to welcome, just like Sarah, I want to welcome you to the third annual Morris Goldsmith Lecture. The Morris Goldsmith Lecture, as Sarah said, is a public lecture devoted to the memory of a much-loved member of the philosophy program at Victoria University. Morris was a passionate man who had many loves and was not reticent about showing them. Morris loved good food, good wine, and more Wilsons. He loved gardening, he loved traveling, he loved a good joke. But most of all, I think he loved philosophy and he loved talking. So it's fitting that we celebrate his memory with an annual philosophy talk. Morris was Emeritus Professor of Political Theory at the University of Exeter where he held the chair from 1969 until moving to New Zealand in 1989. Subsequently, he was lecturer, senior lecturer, and then research fellow in the philosophy program at Victoria. He wrote widely on political philosophy, ethics, and the history of ideas, including several books and articles on Mandeville and Hobbes. Morris was also the editor of the Australasian Journal of Philosophy from 2002 until 2007. The AJP, as it is often known, is one of the most prestigious international journals consistently ranked within the top tier of five or so philosophy journals. Its continued success is due in no small part to Morris's dedication and attention to detail during his time at the helm. Anyone who knew Morris at that time knew that he had a broad interest in all things philosophical and not like so many philosophers, in, uh, only in his own particular field or discipline. Morris always asked interesting and penetrating questions, and he always had a decisive and concise refutation of any arguments. It was always the same refutation. <laughs> Every time, a, a simple recitation with the right intonation of, yeah, right. The one thing that struck me most about Morris, though, was his generous nature. 
And obviously, I'm not alone in this respect. I can honestly say that I've never met anyone as big-hearted as Morris was. Morris would always host grand parties, contribute the most wine to philosophy events, and regularly supply students and staff with biscuits and treats over coffee. He would drive people around, picking up visitors to Wellington, driving them to the top of Mount Victoria to appreciate the view before taking them down to their final destination. He would accommodate all comers in his apartment and invite them enthusiastically to spend time with him and his much-loved wife, Elizabeth, at their batch at Te Horo. One year, he hired a minivan and drove a group of poor but enthusiastic honours students to the New Zealand Annual Philosophy Conference. Along the way, he ensured that all were fed well. I can imagine the van was returned with a lingering scent of cheese, salami, salmon and avocado. Morris was the kind of guy who would give you the shirt off his back literally. In 2008, Morris passed away. He left a big gap in the philosophy program. Morris, you always said it would take two people to replace you. Well, you were wrong about that. You'll ne we will never be able to replace you. But we will remember you, your extraordinary ge generosity, your fabulous hospitality, your enormous capacity for joy. And we do that in part by inviting every year some of the world's most eminent philosophers to talk about what interested you. This year, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Susan Wolfe. As Sarah mentioned, Susan is Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Her research interests are exactly the same as Morris's. Her research is in ethics, moral philosophy, moral psychology, political philosophy, action theory, and aesthetics. But she has an interest in everything philosophical. Her lecture tonight is on aesthetic responsibility. Please join me in welcoming Professor Susan Wolfe. Thank you. Get ready here. I don't know which way is to do this. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real honor. And um, hearing all those words about Morris Goldsmith, it's even more of an honor. And um, he sounds like my kind of guy. <laughs> a quick survey of the philosophical literature on responsibility will immediately reveal that the word responsibility is used in a multitude of ways for a multitude of purposes. The term is frequently invoked in the context of inquiries into the causes of things. What is responsible for that clump of dead trees? Was it an avalanche or a storm or an infestation of beetles? What is responsible for the smile on your face? A good grade, a new friend, or the overdue sunny weather? This causal use of the term is often contrasted with another, and as it might be thought, deeper sense of responsibility that is intended when one wants to know not only what caused an event or state of affairs, but whether anyone, and if so, who, deserves blame or credit for it, or whether the event reflects something about the individuals who had a role in its occurrence that would make punishment or reward condemnation or gratitude or admiration appropriate. The contrast between these two broad senses of responsibility is often marked with the labels of causal and moral responsibility, respectively. For the most obvious illustrations of the distinction are ones in which it is the legitimacy or appropriateness of moral judgments and attitudes that are at issue. One would not blame, at least not morally blame, an avalanche or even a horde of beetles for killing the trees. They don't deserve punishment, nor would indignation toward them be appropriate. If a camper carelessly dropped a cigarette that started a forest fire that killed the trees, on the other hand, that would be another story. Similarly, it seems, one wouldn't credit, or at least not morally credit, the sunshine for one good one's good mood 
But if someone had gone out of her way to benefit you, a certain kind of gratitude and praise might be appropriate. Philosophical interest in what is typically called moral responsibility also has a wide range of sources and is linked to a correspondingly wide range of issues. Since moral praise and especially moral blame have serious consequences, it's a matter of great importance. It's a matter of great importance to know when and under what conditions the relevant moral judgments and attitudes are deserved. A less obviously practical but still clearly philosophical reason for being interested in this kind of responsibility, though, is the thought that responsibility is somehow connected with what makes us distinctively human. For it seems that humans, and only humans, at least among the creatures with whom we are currently in contact, can be appropriate bearers of the kinds of attitudes and judgments we might hold toward the careless camper, for example, as opposed to the beetles. And it doesn't seem unreasonable to think that was the insect beetles, I, <laughs> not the musicians. And it doesn't seem unreasonable to think that this fact is reflective of something important about ourselves. A connection of this sort is explicitly suggested in Harry Frankfurt's famous article, Freedom of the Will and the Concept of a Person, and it's close to the surface of some other seminal articles of that period as well. I, too, am interested in the connection between our status as responsible agents and what sets us apart from other animals and at least present-day machines. But I suspect that the tendency to identify the sense of responsibility that might be illuminating for this purpose with specifically moral responsibility leads us to overemphasize certain aspects of our psychologies and to neglect the importance of others. For this reason, I want to look at what appear to be instances of responsibility that are akin to instances of moral responsibility in being more than and deeper than causal responsibility but that are concerned with judgments and attitudes that are not particularly or essentially moral. I want specifically to look at the range of phenomena that suggest that there is such a thing as aesthetic responsibility. By aesthetic responsibility, I mean to refer to a kind of deep but non-moral responsibility that an artist may have for the aesthetic qualities of his or her artwork. That there is such a thing is suggested by several kinds of experience. Consider first the following examples. You have a friend who is an aspiring painter whose work is largely non-representational. You walk into his studio one day and are struck by a canvas still on the easel. You're inclined to think it is the best thing he's ever done, but before you get beyond your initial wow, he says, oh, that's just a mistake. I knocked some paint cans over on the canvas and haven't gotten around to cleaning it off yet. Or suppose that you read a short story that impresses you for its ability to succeed on two levels. Read straight, it has an interesting plot, decent characters, and a sensible message. But certain details call to mind a Greek legend that allow you to interpret also as a wry commentary on an ancient tale. The protagonist is named Penelope, let's say, and the story concerns her way of handling some overly aggressive suitors. Now, imagine your reaction when you discover that the parallels to Homer are purely accidental. In fact, the author has never heard of the Odyssey, and she named her heroine after Penelope Cruz. In both these cases, as I understand them, you are initially inclined to credit the artist, but reasonably withdraw your credit upon learning that the qualities in the art you admired were merely accidental. Although the artist in each case remains causally responsible for the artwork, he spilled the paint after all and she wrote the story, neither are aesthetically responsible for the qualities that made you initially like the art. The fact that in these examples we find it natural to withdraw credit highlights the fact that in more typical cases we give credit. Other things equal, we take it for granted that the features of an artwork that make it good, that is, that make it beautiful, interesting, moving, insightful, and so on, are due to the artist. 
They are not independent of the artist's aesthetic vision and skill. But my interest in aesthetic responsibility isn't restricted to the question of whether artists deserve credit or its opposite for the aesthetic qualities of their artworks. At least as important is the appropriateness of a range of judgments and attitudes that are not solely or primarily evaluative. Most of us, when we respond to art, do not just judge them on a scale of aesthetic excellence insofar as we do this at all. We like some art, some music, some novels more than others. And in many cases, the way we feel about the art gives rise to or perhaps is inseparable from feelings or attitudes towards the artist. I love Henry James, but not James Joyce, Matisse, but not Picasso, even though I readily admit that the artistic excellence of the artists I prefer is no greater than that of the ones who leave me cold. It isn't just credit that I give the ones who are my favorites. It's also a kind of affection. Yeah. All right. <laughs> there is, then, an emotional aspect to the attitudes many of us have toward our favorite authors, composers, and filmmakers. In some people, it fuels an interest in the biographies of these artists. In others, like me, it explains a reluctance to learn about the rest of the artist's life for fear of spoiling or complicating the image that supports one's positive feelings. There are fan clubs or more formally named societies for artists ranging from Smokey Robinson to Chopin, from A.A. A. Milne to Anthony Trollope. And I suspect that most of the members of such organizations would describe their attitudes to their subjects in warmly personal terms. These attitudes seem to me of a piece with the sorts of attitudes P.F. Strawson discusses in Freedom and Resentment. Wanting to bring out the close connections between our practice of holding people morally responsible for their actions and our tendencies to regard them as appropriate objects of such attitudes as gratitude and resentment, Strawson contrasts these reactive attitudes with the objective attitude. To adopt the objective attitude to another human being, Strawson writes, is to see him perhaps as an object of social policy, as something certainly to be taken account, perhaps precautionary account of, to be managed or handled or cured or trained, perhaps simply to be avoided. The objective attitude, he continues, may be emotionally toned in many ways, but not in all ways. It may include repulsion or fear. It may include pity or even love, though not all kinds of love. But it cannot include the range of, activ the range of reactive feelings and attitudes which belong to involvement or participation with others in interpersonal human relationships. It cannot include resentment, gratitude, forgiveness, anger, or the sort of love which two adults can sometimes be said to feel reciprocally for each other. As Strassen notes, we can take the objective attitude towards any individual, at least for a limited time, but there are some individuals and some kinds of individuals about whom we think that only the objective attitude is appropriate. Lower animals, young children, and machines presumably belong to this category, as do adult human beings with certain severe forms of mental illness or incapacity. Strawson's focus, like that of most philosophers who write on freedom and responsibility, is on moral responsibility and on the moral or near-moral attitudes that are reactions to the good or ill will one person exhibits towards another. But insofar as he includes the sort of love which two adults can sometimes be said to feel reciprocally for each other in his list of reactive attitudes, he suggests that the moral and near moral attitudes are part of a larger set. For the basis for such love is hardly limited to the degree to which the parties show goodwill to each other. Whom we love and how our loving relationships go may have as much to do with the individual's senses of humor, their responses to nature, or their political engagement. It seems to me that the attitude of love, affection, 
or alternatively of chilliness or distaste that one might have toward an artist on the basis of her artwork falls into this broader range. Indeed, it seems easy to imagine a person literally falling in love with a poet or painter on the basis of his poetry or painting, for better or worse, I might add, and, and to see how an already established loving relationship can suffer as a result of how the one responds to the other's art. In any case, it seems that the tendency to form attitudes of affection or distaste toward an, toward an artist on the basis of her artwork is premised on assumptions about the kind of creature the artist is in ways significantly similar to the way that our paradigmatic reactive attitudes are conditioned. If one learned that a cherished painting had been painted by an elephant, or that a musical composition one admired had been produced by a machine, I suspect that any tendency one had to love the artist would spontaneously disappear. Insofar as our tendency to resent or feel gratitude to another for his actions is indicative of our taking him to be morally responsible then, I want to suggest that our, at, our tendency to feel affection or distaste for an artist on the basis of her artworks is a sign that we take her to be aesthetically responsible as well. Although I hope and expect that my discussion so far has called up experiences that will be familiar to most of you, I also expect that some will be skeptical of my interpretation of these phenomena and that others, even if they agree that such experiences do reflect a tendency to hold artists aesthetically responsible, will think that the tendency should be suppressed rather than validated. My claim that we have reactive attitudes towards artists on the basis of their artworks will not resonate with everyone. Some will not find in themselves any feelings towards the artists of the works they admire or despise. When they watch a movie or look at a painting or listen to music, they'll say they focus on the artwork and don't give the artist a moment's thought. Though they might have, have a favorite painter, composer, or director, they take that to mean only that the artist in question is a reliable creator of work that they feel confident that they will find rewarding. It reflects no deeper or more reactive an attitude toward the artist than one would have toward a bird whose song one finds particularly pleasing, or a car manufacturer whose cars one has been consistently satisfied with. My first response to such a skeptic is to wonder whether our experiences of art can really be as different as our words seem to reflect. Perhaps my descriptions of the attitudes and judgments I mean to refer to have highlighted aspects of these phenomena in misleading ways. For I, too, focus on and even get immersed in the experience of the artworks themselves. What attitudes I have towards the artists are, in most contexts, of secondary interest and often go by unnoticed. Nor do I mean to claim that the tendency to form reactive attitudes or even judgments awarding more or less aesthetic credit to artists is universal among art lovers, or that people who sometimes form such attitudes and judgments form them in connection with every artist, artist whose work they appreciate. Some kinds of art, some individual artworks, are more apt to evoke such reactive attitudes than others. Some artworks express a point of view or an emotional experience that one naturally takes to be a reflection, if not an intentional communication of a person's soul. Other works, either more purely sensual or more purely cerebral, are less likely to be seen as outpourings of a unique human sensibility. Furthermore, different people engage with the arts for different reasons. They look for and receive different kinds of rewards. In speaking of the phenomena that I take to reflect a tendency to see artists as aesthetically responsible then, I have no wish to make normative, much less universal judgments about how people should experience art. It's enough for my purposes to bring attention to the fact that many people do respond to art in this way. If the skeptic doesn't find such experiences in himself, he can consider the reactions of others. It is important to me, however, that such reactions be legitimate. So I need to respond to objections that charge 
that the tendency to regard artists as aesthetically responsible for their artworks is in some way wrong or misguided. Two sorts of objections seem especially likely, one epistemic, the other aesthetic. The first objection concerns the thought that the judgments and attitudes we form towards artists on the basis of their artworks are frequently based on assumptions that are epistemically unsound. Who has not been tempted to infer from a particularly realistic or insightful novel or film that the events portrayed by the novelist or filmmaker are partly autobiographical? Many of us may also tend to assume that in order for emotions to be effectively conveyed in a piece of music or a poem, they must have been experienced by the artist herself, or even that an actor who convincingly portrays intelligence must be intelligent, or that one who excels in portraying psychologically twisted characters must be somewhat twisted himself. That's Christopher Walken, for those who don't know. To the charge of inferring more about the lives and characters of artists from their artworks than is warranted, I plead guilty. I often make unsound leaps from artists' works to their lives and personalities, and I'm often proved wrong. But such inferences are not a necessary part of attributions of aesthetic responsibility, and these are not the attitudes and judgments I am concerned to defend. The judgments and attitudes that constitute attributions of aesthetic responsibility can be, and often are, narrow. They presuppose that the aesthetic qualities of the artwork come from the artist in a way that is more than merely causal, but they don't need to assume that they show anything more about him than that he had it in him, psychologically, to create this very artwork. Even this, however, a critic might object, is apt to be an ungrounded assumption. Who knows which aesthetically relevant features an artist put into her work on purpose, as opposed to ones that appear in the work accidentally. Sometimes it's true an artist leaves notes or gives an interview that tells us what went through her mind. Sometimes an artist makes clear in a work's title what she thinks the work is about. But often she does not, and when artists do speak about what they take their work to mean, or about what they find aesthetically significant about it, their remarks are often disappointingly vague, pretentious, or full of spiritual gibberish. So here's one. Moreover, and here, the epistemic objection blends into an aesthetic one. Why should we care about what the artist put into her work non-accidentally in the first place? Isn't it better to just look or listen to the works themselves, to see what we find in them independently of the artist's intentions? For an artist doesn't have privileged access to or authority over the meaning or the value of her work. The fact that an, that an artist intends her work to express something is no guarantee that the work succeeds in doing so, nor does the fact that an artist doesn't intend to express something mean that it doesn't express it nonetheless. To the charge that our tendency to regard artists as aesthetically responsible for their art encourages us to accept inaccurate images of the artist, we now add the objection that this tendency encourages a regrettable approach to appreciating and understanding the art. This second criticism is a form of the intentional fallacy, a critique of an approach to literary interpretation given prominence by William Wimsatt and Monroe Beardsley in the 1950s. Though I'm largely symp sympathetic with the core of Wimsatt and Beardsley's position, their criticism criticisms are often understood in ways that seem to me unacceptably broad. Specifically, although the fallacy that Wimsatt and Beardsley argue for is literally and eponymously directed at the idea that an artist's intentions are of key importance to a correct understanding of her work, the objection is frequently interpreted as a rejection of the tendency to connect the meaning and significance of an artwork with the psychology of the artist at all. 
The broader interpretation of the intentional fallacy, as well as the aesthetic objection to ascriptions of aesthetic responsibility I formulated a moment ago, blur the distinction between the question of whether an aesthetic feature of a work reflects the artist's intentions and the question of whether it is the product of the artist's psychology more generally. And although I agree with Wimsett and Beardsley that emphasis on the former question is usually a bad strategy for the appreciation of art, to utterly dismiss the latter question seems to me, with respect to a great deal of art, disastrous. For the fact that an artist did not intend to, did not intend to communicate what in fact the art calls up to much of its audience doesn't imply that what the artwork evokes doesn't come from the artist in some significant way. We can easily imagine a songwriter saying, I didn't mean to write a sad song, while simultaneously acknowledging that the sadness that, that is there is an unintentional manifestation of something in him. I tried to be careful in characterizing aesthetic responsibility to describe the assumed connection between an artist's psychology and the aesthetic features of her work in vague terms. I said that it's a condition of holding an artist aesthetically responsible in this way, that the features be non-accidental, that when we credit or form a reactive attitude to the artist on the basis for our artwork, we presuppose that it shows something about the artist, namely that the artist had it in her to create precisely this work but I deliberately avoided any talk of an artist's intentions, decisions, or choices, or any suggestion that the artist would know, much less be in a position to say, exact, exactly what he was doing aesthetically or why. We're too familiar with stories of artists whose poetry, paintings, or songs were composed when they were on drugs or in dreamlike states of others who talk about being taken over by their muses and of the mysteries of the creative process to expect or assume that all the aesthetic features of a work to which we respond are the result of an artist's intentions. But this doesn't stop us from crediting the artist with the particular aesthetic vision that is realized in her artwork. To deny that it matters to our understanding and appreciation of art whether an artwork reflects an artist's psychology at all, would commit one to the view that it is irrelevant even that an artwork is a product of human or other intelligent sensibility. It would imply that it is or should be irrelevant to one's experience of an interestingly shaped piece of stone, whether it was sculpted by a human agent or shaped by the forces of wind and rain that it is or should be irrelevant to one's experience of a set of words on a page, whether it was composed by a poet or was rather, as some fanciful philosophical essays would have us imagine, the product of a monkey plunking on a keyboard. Recalling examples I brought up earlier, it would imply that it shouldn't matter to our experience of a painting whether it was done by a person or an elephant, or to our experience of a piece of music whether it was composed by a human or a machine. At least one influential theorist of art, Clive Bell, advocated this radical doctrine. His extreme doctrine of aesthetic formalism claimed that the only thing of aesthetic significance in the visual arts was significant form, defined as combinations of lines and colors that provoke a distinctive aesthetic emotion. For Bell, the aesthetic qualities of a painting do not even depend on whether the painting is representational or, if the painting is representational, on what it represents. Indeed, Bell goes so far as to say that representation in a painting is at best a distraction. But this is an absurd thing to say of Hopper's Nighthawks or Fra Angelico's Annunciation or a late Rembrandt self-portrait. Part of what it is to appreciate these paintings is to recognize the sense of human isolation, of beatific serenity, and of psychological insight that is inextricable from seeing these paintings as the evocative artworks they are. 
if it is not literally impossible to see paintings in this way without assuming that they were produced non-accidentally by human beings, it is at least a distraction rather than an aid to appreciation to try to suppress or deny this assumption. If we turn to literature, the idea that the author or poet is irrelevant to literary interpretation is even more obviously outrageous. For the very recognition of the marks on the page, or the sounds on the audio tape as words, much less as metaphors and puns, character sketches and plots, presupposes that they are products of a human intelligence. And indeed, of a human intelligence equipped with a culturally and historically specific language. At any rate, few aestheticians would go so far as Bell. Even Wimsatt and Beardsley admit that a poem does not come into existence by accident. The words of a poem come out of a head, not out of a hat. Clarifying the assumptions on which the according of aesthetic responsibility rests should, I believe, put both the epistemic and the aesthetic objection to our tendency to regard artists as aesthetically responsible to rest. The assumption that the aesthetic features of artworks show something about their artists, though falsifiable, seems innocent enough, and if that assumption, along with one's experience of a work, grounds an impulse to, feel, to credit or feel affection or distaste for an artist, so be it. Still, those who don't find such a tendency in themselves might continue to feel uncomfortable, suspicious that those who do have such a tendency are likely to come to art for the wrong reasons and to experience art in a less than optimal way. Again, let me emphasize that I have no wish to make any normative claims about the appreciation of art. I do not mean to suggest that people ought, consciously and deliberately, to regard artists as aesthetically responsible, much less that the point of art is to give you insight into the artist's soul or to put you in a relationship with him, giving you results that would be more efficiently and straightforwardly achieved by reading the artist's autobiography or just taking him to lunch. It's rather that for many consumers of art, including myself, we just do automatically and spontaneously regard artists as aesthetically responsible for their art. We cannot help but experience much art as a non-accidental product of an intelligent artist, sometimes as a reflection of the artist's soul or as an expression of the artist's point of view or of her distinctive aesthetic vision. If we particularly admire or even love the work of art, we may find ourselves naturally crediting and feeling grateful to the artists. At the least, I've argued, such responses are unobjectionable in most cases, but for large categories of art, they are more than that. Leo Tolstoy, in his treatise on aesthetics, What is Art, wrote, that every work of art causes the receiver to enter into a certain kind of relationship, both with him who produced or is producing the art, and with all those who simultaneously, previously, or subsequently receive the same artistic impression. Speech, transmitting the thoughts and experiences of men, serves as a means of union among them, and art acts in a similar manner. The peculiarity of this latter means of intercourse being that whereas by words a man transmits his thoughts to another, by means of art he transmits his feelings. Although Tolstoy overgeneralized and overmoralized in presenting this claim as a universal norm, the continued appeal and popularity of his theory of art testifies to the fact that the kind of glimpse into another's heart and soul and the communion with the artist, as well as with other similarly responding appreciators of art, are among, are, are among the deepest and most common rewards art has to offer. Another immensely important benefit of art is its ability to expand our knowledge and understanding of the range of human character and sensibility our world contains. Both such rewards are premised on the assumption that art is a reflection of what the artist feels, sees, and thinks. Both such rewards thus rely on the assumption that, 
in the sense I've been meaning to point out, artists are commonly aesthetically responsible for the aesthetic features of their artworks. But should we really refer to the phenomena I've been discussing as involving a kind of responsibility? Although the term seems natural when introduced in some contexts, it may seem out of place or misleading in others. The word comes easily when contrasting the relationship of an artist to a canvas he painted with his relationship to one in which he clump, clumsily knocked over some cans of paint, or when explaining the shift in our attitudes when we discover that the artist of a strikingly colored painting was colorblind, or that the writer of an evocative string of words doesn't speak the language of the words he wrote down. There is an enormous difference between learning that an aesthetically interesting object, a visual or a tactile form or a series of words or a set of musical notes was painted or written or composed by a conscious human being and learning that it came about by someone slipping on some paint or copying words from a dictionary or plunking, plunking random keys on a keyboard. And this difference affects our attitudes and judgments about both the object and its creator. It doesn't seem unnatural to express this, this difference by saying that in the first case, but not in the second, we find the creator or artist responsible for the aesthetic features of her creation. And to say this is to suggest that there is a difference between merely causal responsibility and another kind, which is deeper. But the patterns according to which we form and withdraw attitudes and judgments towards artists on the basis of their artworks are in some ways quite different from those that characterize our practices of according moral responsibility. And when we focus on these differences, we may find the idea that there are two kinds of responsibility here more confusing than helpful. In particular, it's commonly thought that whether a person is morally responsible for something depends on whether he could have done otherwise, or on whether he had control over his behavior, or on whether he knew what he was doing. If a person is morally responsible, it's been said, he should be able to explain or justify his behavior. It is at the least appropriate to ask him to do so. He's answerable for what he has done. As I pointed out in the previous section, however, we apply no such conditions in cases of aesthetic responsibility. We don't expect Shakespeare or Cezanne or Mozart to be able to explain their choices of words, lines, and notes. And the question of whether they could have done otherwise, written different plays, pa painted different paintings, composed different symphonies, seems utterly beside the point in determining what attitudes to have to these artists on the basis of their art. Focusing on these contrasts may make us think that the attitudes we form towards artists on the basis of their artwork, even the attitudes of credit, are not really manifestations of a belief in anything properly called responsibility. We admire Shakespeare, certainly, for his richly insightful, clever, and moving plays, but it seems odd to say that we hold him responsible for these works. Those familiar with the philosophical literature on responsibility may have heard of a distinction introduced by Gary Watson between two senses of responsibility, both different from and deeper than causal responsibility, that Watson called attributability and accountability. According to Watson, we invoke the attributability sense when by saying X is responsible for Y, we mean to attribute y to x in the sense that we take y to show something about x, to be disclosive of x's self. In other instances, Watson reminds us, we use the expression to say that x may properly be held accountable for y. If y is bad, this would justify our blaming x or punishing him, or expecting him to explain, apologize, or compensate the victim for y's effects. The idea that an individual must be in control of something in order for him to be responsible for it is highly plausible if one is thinking of responsibility as accountability, much less so in connection with attributability. 
The question of whether we should think of responsibility as actually having these two senses, rather than one or three or even more, is a matter of much debate. I don't want to enter into this debate here, but Watson's distinction may be useful in helping us understand the ambivalence or confusion some might have toward the idea of aesthetic responsibility. For once this distinction is articulated, it seems clear that our discussion of aesthetic responsibility had attributability rather than accountability in mind. Indeed, as I have been using the phrase, to say that an artist is aesthetically responsible for her art is simply to say that the work can be attributed to her in a deeper or stronger than a merely causal sense, that it has a stronger and more personal connection to her than a mere causal connection would imply, that it comes from her and says something about her, that it is disclosive of herself. It's relatively unimportant whether one wants to use the word responsibility to refer to this connection, though unfortunately to substitute talk of attributability here would bring problems of its own. One problem is that the word is so vague and colorless that it gives no indication of a difference between attributing something to an individual and simply predicating it of her, and mere predication is much too broad to capture what is intended by the term. The other is that in the domain of art in particular, attribution already has a fixed and different meaning. To attribute a work of art to an artist is simply to identify him as the person who created it, as opposed to students in his workshop or others in his school. In any case, I believe that our ambivalence and confusion about how to refer to and think about the phenomena that manifests what I've been calling aesthetic responsibility shows us something about both the concepts that philosophers discuss and about the relation of these concepts to our lives and self-understanding. Let me conclude by pointing out a couple of the lessons that I think can be learned from these reflections. One lesson that can be learned or reinforced is that the concept of deep, not merely causal responsibility is not as clear or as clean as many people take and want it to be. There are some contexts in which the term seems apt in thinking about the relation between artists and their artworks, and other contexts in which it seems inappropriate, even though one's referring to the very same relation. As I've mentioned, one way philosophers deal with this distinguishes different senses of responsibility, including at least responsibility as attributability and responsibility as accountability. Another, or perhaps only a verbal variant of the first, understands responsibility to refer only to accountability and treats the notion of attributability as an independent concept. Though I don't favor one of these approaches over the other, thinking about the phenomena that I've been referring to as indications of aesthetic responsibility gives added reason to think that some such distinction or clarification is necessary for understanding our talk of responsibility. But attributability itself, if it's meant to refer to a substantial and interesting relation between individuals and their actions, properties, and effects, is far from well understood. Earlier, following Watson, I characterized it as having to do with a disclosure or reflection of a self. But what is a self? On what basis do we or should we regard beings as having or being selves as opposed to just being creatures or objects of other sorts? Can a robot be or have a self? What about a chicken, an infant, a two-year-old? And on what basis do we or should we decide what is part of someone's self and what is alien to it? Strawson's discussion of the contrast between reactive attitudes and the objective attitude, mentioned earlier in this lecture, is suggestive in this context. For there's something plausible in the idea that the only kinds of creatures to whom we find it reasonable to robustly attribute things, the only kinds of beings that we tend to think of as having sufficiently complex, intelligent, and sensitive selves, are the ones to whom we find it appropriate to have reactive attitudes. Moreover, 
This, this thought seems equally plausible in connection with aesthetic cases as it does in connection with moral ones. Remembering that Strawson also connects the appropriateness of the reactive attitudes with the potential for involvement or participation with others in interpersonal human relationships, suggests that the task of understanding what it is to be or to have a self is closely related to the task of understanding what it is to be distinctively human. It is perhaps with respect to this question that attention to the phenomena I've been discussing today can be most philosophically useful as a corrective to an unduly narrow identification of humanity with rational agency that has dominated philosophical thought. When we ask what it takes to be human, understanding this as a broadly ethical rather than a scientific and biological question, the first thing that leaps out at us tends to be our intelligence, which we have to a higher degree than any other creatures with whom we are acquainted. Historically, we've tended to identify intelligence with the capacity to reason, the ability to think abstractly, and the ability to use language. These, in turn, have led to our ability to justify our beliefs and actions to ourselves and to others, and our abilities to act in accordance with laws we give ourselves and with values we endorse. No doubt these abilities play a large role in what makes us, as a class, especially interesting and important to each other. They're essential to our ability to engage in scientific inquiry and in our ability to be moral agents. But our experience of art, at least the experience of some of us, of the experience of some art, as well as the urge to make art, which I've barely touched on in this paper, also suggests or points to features that make us especially interesting and important to each other. And when we ask ourselves what kinds of individuals might be capable of what I've been calling aesthetic responsibility, we are unlikely to focus on quite the same traits and capacities or identify the same range of creatures. It seems possible to imagine rational creatures perhaps extraterrestrials or very advanced machines who lack the capacity to create or appreciate anything we can recognize as art and to imagine if not actually find individuals who do create significant art even though they lack the deliberative powers and control that would be needed to regard them as fully morally responsible agents. The importance of art in people's lives both the drive to create it and the passion to experience it, is a remarkable fact of human life, universal across place and time and culture. Arguably, it is as much a mark of the human as is the use of language. Presumably, part of why art moves or speaks to us so strongly is that through art we can discover and make contact with the emotions, experiences, thoughts, and perspectives of other human souls. Thinking about what it takes to create art that we respond to in this way, as opposed to what might fortuitously bring about an interesting or appealing array of words, sounds, or shapes, and also perhaps about what it takes to be responsive to the art of others, can thus provide clues to what it is to be human, of what it is to be a self or a soul like us, that are very different from what one gets when one thinks about what it takes for someone to be able to engage in moral deliberation. Thinking along these lines, then, is apt to highlight a somewhat different set of faculties, abilities, and sensitivities from those we notice when we take the paradigm of human activity to be deliberative moral action or rational action. Insofar as we cherish those qualities, that make us capable of aesthetic responsibility as well as moral responsibility, and those faculties that drive us to create art as well as science, it's important that we not neglect these qualities and faculties in our educational practices, our social policies, or our philosophical theories about what it is to be human. <laughs> 